happening here in this little table, 99.5% for SARS and 34% for MERS. And nosocomial transmission is a huge part of the transmission dynamics of this. Uh, people with pneumonia, you uh, have when they're instrumented, when they're, they have suctions, when they have procedures done to them, that's when you see the transmission in, in hospitals. Here's the phylogenetic tree. Up here in the upper right, you can see where uh, SARS is, the 2002 strain of SARS. All these guys here uh, going down below that are bat strains. And then you get into some isolates from the uh, 2000, uh, 2019 uh, novel coronavirus, which we now call SARS-CoV-2. And then down here in a different uh, uh, group of uh, uh, different sort of sub-subclass, here's MERS down here. And this is also a disease of these little animals here. That's a spiny anteater. Um, there is secondary transmission through animals of both MERS and SARS. Uh, for SARS, it's the Himalayan palm civet, which is a little kind of cat-like thing, also called a raccoon dog. And MERS, it's dromedaries, which as you will recall, having spent a thousand birthday parties at the San Diego Zoo growing up, that's uh, two humps. Here's what the uh, organism looks like. It has this S protein, which you can see over here in a 3D model, which has a binding site. This binds to angiotensin converting enzyme in hip, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme sites in the uh, respiratory tree and in the uh, GI tract. So there's a question about angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors possibly playing a therapeutic role, although I think that's whistling past the graveyard. So this first case was hospitalized on December 17th. There was a family cluster of three cases uh, that were recognized at the hospital in Wuhan, China, uh, where they were first uh, isolated. And then additional cases came on, uh, were recognized at that hospital and additional hospitals by, 30, by the 30th of December. There was a clear link to a, a live uh, market, a live uh, meat market, which is called a seafood market, but was much more, which was closed on the 1st of January. The virus was isolated on the 7th of January. It was sequenced three days later, which is remarkable, a remarkable feat of molecular biology. Uh, there were rapid diagnostic tests developed and distributed within a couple of days after that. And then on January 23rd, the central Chinese government imposed a cordon sanitaire, a kind of uh, wrap around shutting down uh, the, whole, the whole city of Wuhan, city of 11 million people and some surrounding cities. Um, WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January, and the outbreak has grown now to more than 130,000 cases and 4,000 deaths through droplet transmission, and droplet transmission is important. I'll come back to that. So respiratory spread, you can have droplet, airborne, or fomite transmission. Airborne transmission, cross it off the list, uh, which creates a whole bunch of gives us a whole big break about hospital infection control because you don't need PAPRs and a lot of other stuff. This is droplet transmission, uh, which is when you cough or sneeze, uh, you expel um, virus-laden laden nuclei of, of saliva or muco, muco, uh, mucinous materials, um, and they kind of arc over and will fall to ground or on somebody's face or something about within about six feet, and OSHA says a meter. Um, hands are also important, which is why we try and discourage people from shaking hands. And then fomite transmission on surfaces has been uh, is probably relatively important too, although we don't have the kind of spectacular outbreak that we saw in the hotel in Hong Kong uh, from SARS where people were getting it from touching the elevator buttons. Um, there's possible, there's GI shedding clearly. Um, how much that contributes to the spread of the disease is unknown, but probably very minimal. What we do know is that 70 to 85% of transmission in China has gone on in families, or for what we would think of as households. Here's the uh, town of, the town, quote unquote, of Hubei, 11 million people, the size of New York City. It sits here on the Yangtze River, so it's a major tra uh, trading uh, uh, point, and it's a huge industrial hub in the middle of the country. Think the sort of Chicago of China, or maybe Detroit. And it's the, the larger province around it is called Hubei. Uh, and you'll hear uh, in some of the WHO things they talk about Hubei province and others they talk about the city of Wuhan. Here is the, um, the seafood market. This is what it looks like. This is during one of the uh, cleanup periods. 
Uh, but these things are dense. They've got lots of people in them. They've got lots of animals. They've got lots of live animals in them. China, by the way, has since banned the, uh, uh, the sale of live animals in these markets forever, period, over and out. This guy is probably the, the intermediate host we've been looking for. These are called pangolins. Uh, they're sort of like aardvarks. Um, and um, uh, this is a, uh, an animal that was sold at these live markets. It's not so much for meat as its scales are used in traditional uh, uh, medicine. So this is probably the secondary, the secondary host we were looking for. The situation as of this morning, so there have been 135,467 cases reported from 104 country with almost 5,000 deaths, which is 3.7% of the reported cases. It is not the case fatality rate. That's a completely different number. So we can come back to that if somebody has questions, but just view it as a simple proportion right now. 63% of the cases are from mainland China, um, and 84% of those are from Hubei province, uh, and 66% uh, of all deaths in the world are from Hubei province. Other affected countries, this list has changed dramatically over the last week. Italy has, uh, uh, I think now, 15,000 cases. Iran has 10,000 cases. South Korea, uh, almost 8,000 cases. And then there's there are large foci of secondary spread uh, through Europe, France, Spain, France, and Germany. In the US, there are 1,663 cases that have been diagnosed with 41 deaths. Um, the three large clusters are in Washington State, New York State, and California. This uh, graph shows you the uh, cases by date of onset and by date of report. This is symptom onset uh, in China. Uh, and you can see this remarkable decline uh, in the incidence of disease. This one big spike here on uh, February 2nd or whenever it is, this uh, blue spike that sticks up, that's the consequence of a change in case definition. It was just in Hubei province uh, where they allowed uh, radiologic evidence of pneumonia to count. It's actually chest CT scans. This shows you the tail in March. Look at the scales on the hundreds. Um, and uh, yesterday there were more cases reported outside of Hubei than in Hubei. And there are eight cases in Hubei. So you've really seen this big dramatic decline. This is the situation worldwide. You can see this large cluster <clears throat> in uh, Europe uh, that's been seeded from Italy. There's also a, a large cluster around the Persian Gulf that's been seeded from uh, Iran, which has a large and uh, growing epidemic. Um, a couple of things to note. There are not very many cases in Africa, thankfully. There are relatively few cases in, in, in Latin America. Um, and in the, if you look at the Southern Hemisphere, where people always want to talk about, you know, you're going to get, there's going to be a miracle in June when the weather turns hot. So it's, you know, there's not a lot of transmission in Australia, Argentina, Chile, uh, or Brazil, or South Africa, but there is some. So it's not a hard and fast rule. The one thing to note about this cluster here in Egypt, that's on a cruise ship, and that was seeded by someone from Taiwan. So cruise ships have been a big amplifier here, at least early on. Um, and you've all heard about the Diamond Princess, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, basically quarantined in Yokohama uh, Harbor and, and sort of, you know, around that area, um, which now have, a, and, and people who were on that ship, there were 696 confirmed cases and seven deaths. Um, there was, so it turns out that that was absolutely the wrong thing to do to try and quarantine people on ships. It was not done particularly well. Uh, and there was a lot of mixing and a lot of transmission. Uh, the Department of State repatriated 400 Americans um, who uh, finished their quarantine on the ship and then put them in another 14-day quarantine. But on that list that they repatriated were 14 people who tested positive, which wasn't known to anyone until the buses pulled up um, at Haneda Airport in, in Tokyo and led to a big debate between CDC and the Department of State. See, uh, Department of State eventually agree, said that they're going to put people, they're going to bring them and put them in isolation, which is this shower curtain you can see up here in the front of the airplane. Um, <clears throat> and um, CDC wouldn't sign the press release. That's how, that's how vitriolic this was. A couple of more cruise ships, the Grand Princess, um, 
uh, here in the East Bay, um, had a cruise from the 11th to 21st of February to Mexico from San Francisco. When they came back, three people got off, two were sick already, one's gotten sick since then, so soon afterwards. Uh, one of the cases died, a 71-year-old man from Placer County. Um, and then there's now been 21 cases from the February cruise in total. Um, the new cruise to Hawaii departed on the 21st with uh, 62 passengers left over from this first cruise, plus uh, a whole new group of passengers. That's the thing that got back on March 9th to Oakland. There's a little picture down here of the Coast Guard flying out test kits. So the 3,500 passengers and crew coming back from Hawaii, 21 tested positive, which were two passengers and 19 crew, and the 19 crew presumably had been infected uh, back in February on the prior, prior uh, cruise ship, prior cruise. So they've all been tested. The asymptomatic passengers are being quarantined at uh, Air Force bases or Naval Air Stations, and the crew's being quarantined on the ship. They're supposed to be at sea. When I drove home yesterday, the ship was still right there. You could see it right off the Bay Bridge. It was all lit up to quite pretty. There's another uh, small cluster in Egypt, as I said, um, with 45 cases in, in total, including both uh, passengers and crew. Uh, this was seeded by someone coming from Taiwan, uh, and all these patients have been uh, taken back, to, uh, taken to hospitals. Um, the Department of State, uh, always quick on the takeoff on March 9th, recommend that Americans avoid cruise ships. It's right, probably not a bad idea. So the story, the recent story of COVID-19, which is the name of the disease as far as the SARS-CoV-9, I'm sorry, I should have said that. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. COVID-19 is the name of the disease. Are these three large clusters, one in South Korea, one in Italy and Europe, and the other in Iran and the Middle East. So the first thing to see is that there's been this turnover in Korea. Whatever they've done in Korea, they've been doing right. This is a period of about three weeks. So that's a best case scenario. This Europe is a worst case scenario uh, with this rapid expansion. Um, Iran is also expanding. It's a little tough to get information out of there, uh, but, that's, uh, but that's what's going on. So if you look at South Korea and Italy, uh, South Korea has had uh, about 7,900 cases and 66 deaths. This had something, had a little break here in that these cases were predominantly from a, uh, among a, an extended church sect. I think it's, sect seems like a value-laden term, but that's what they say. Um, that was centered on the southeastern peninsula, a southeastern peninsula near the city of Daegu. Um, and that's, um, uh, so that made containment a little bit easier. They did all sorts of stuff, including essentially locking down the country um, there's one case in a U.S. Uh, soldier uh, in Korea. But note that the epidemic is starting to wane, and the case fatality rate here is 0.8%, which I suspect is a lot closer to the real case fatality rate. Uh, Italy has had 15,000 cases. It's growing by leaps and bounds. The 1,000 deaths is primarily concentrated in the Lombardy region. Uh, the entire country has been placed in a cordon sanitaire on March 9th, and only groceries, pharmacies, pharmacies banks, and public transit can, um, can stay open. The U.S. has had this level three travel warning for Italy uh, to avoid unnecessary, avoid all but essential travel. Um, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, prime minister issued the uh, facile advice of avoiding furbizia, and furbizia kind of means sneaking around the bureaucracy. I was on a seminar this morning with the head of uh, anesthesiology and intensive care at one of the big hospitals in Milano. And um, contrary to what's being reported in the press, they're not rationing intensive care. Uh, their, mant their mantra, this is region wide in Northern Italy, their mantra is if you need intensive care, you get intensive care. It doesn't matter if you're 90 years old or, or, or 40 years old. This is what they're uh, looking at. As of this morning, there have been uh, 1,100 cases in healthcare workers, which is a real mess. Um, and uh, there have been 800 total deaths out of uh, uh, 13,000 uh, cases. Uh, and you can see down here the um, mortality increases with age. See, it's, but it's really almost nothing down here in the, not nothing, nothing, but certainly under 50, it's minimal. 
but it starts to ramp up. And then as you get up here in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it's uh, substantial. In Iran, uh, there are large, more than 10,000 cases and uh, 400 odd deaths. It's based, on, it's based around a religious city called Qom. Now, there have been a lot of people in the government who've gotten this, including um, there's, Iran has a system with four vice presidents. So the senior most vice president has gotten it along with several other, uh, other people. And there's been this spread around the, around the region. In the US, there have been 1,600 plus deaths, plus cases, and 41 deaths to date. 272 have been related to travel. Uh, 43 were from the Diamond Princess and 42 from the Grand Princess. 302 were transmitted from a, in the U.S. from a known source. This includes 56 nosocomial cases, uh, this nursing home in Kirkland, and um, a cl small cluster in Vacaville, and 1,000 are from unknown sources. Uh, there are large clusters in Westchester County, so uh, um, centered around a synagogue, in uh, New Rochelle, where the uh, original case was imported. And in Boston, a, a, an outbreak among people who attended a business meeting. Um, there's widespread transmission in Washington State, as, as I said before, in 20 total cases. There's this cluster in, in the nursing home in Kirkland. Um, and the models suggest that it's been spreading for several, that it's been spreading for several weeks before the first case appeared at the nursing home with probably more than a uh, something on this order of magnitude, 150 to 1,500 people uh, infected. So in California, so, uh, so here's, a, here's a point. We don't know what the epidemiology of this disease is because there are not enough testing kits available, which has been a huge mess um, and has really limited response, uh, not only at a public health response and control measures, but also severely limited our ability to understand where the leading edge of the epidemic is. In California, there have been 251 cases and four deaths. Testing is still lagging. So just to give you an idea, at one point in time last week, there had been something like 700 cases, 700 tests done in the United States. At the same time in South Korea, there have been 170,000 done. So it's a huge, big difference. Yesterday, the governor announced a ban of gatherings of more than 250 people breaking my heart because I had plans to take advantage of this. Disneyland announced its closure. Um, and there's some other uh, kinds of things over here you can see. In San Francisco, there have been 19 cases uh, reported, actually 24 as of this morning. They're 12 in one cluster. Um, and uh, there's clearly community transmission. That's even more so in Santa Clara County where there's 66 cases reported. Um, and the Stanford, San Jose State, and Cal have all um, stopped classes and moved to online education. Alameda has nine confirmed cases. So how severe is this disease? Um, the original report suggested a high, uh, a high uh, suggested severe disease uh, with 32% admitted to the ICU and 50% dying. Um, while there are a lot of early exposures to the seafood market, um, they also in this original, uh, original report, they documented person-to-person -person transmission. The most recent series from China, small series of 72,000 patients, and these are the numbers that quoted 81% mild, 1% asymptomatic, 14% moderate, meaning dyspnea to kipnea, with an oxygen saturation of 93% and infiltrates and then 5% requiring ICU level uh, care. Healthcare workers have not been widely infected here. It was about 4%. Remember in MERS it's 70% and in SARS it's pushing 50%. This is one of the really interesting things about there appears to be no disease in children or minimal disease in children. Almost all of these children are asymptomatic um, and only come to medical attention because of contact tracing in, in families. I'll come back to that point. Uh, here is the presenting symptoms in China. This is from Monday morning, um, Tuesday morning, I'm sorry. The fever is a predominant symptom. These bars are mild, severe, and critical disease. Cough in about half, um, and then it goes down. So fever is really the, the, the principal uh, uh, symptom. So our current understanding um, 
is that this is most likely a single introduction to humans and person to person spread. The R naught is around 2.7, at least initially. The doubling time is around six days. The incubation period, which has been looked at by several authors and the most convincing evidence is that it's 5.2 days. Uh, there's a median age of 49 to 56 years in different series. Um, and, K and what's been really substantiated in Korea and in Italy is that cases are very, very rare in infants and children. Um, viral shedding can occur for 24 to 48 hours before the onset of symptoms and continues for seven to 12 days in mild to moderate disease and more than 14 days in severe disease. The Chinese require two negative PCRs for people to be discharged from care. Um, Seattle has, or somebody, um, Seattle has, the state of Washington has uh, trying, because they need beds, they've been pushing it down to one negative PCR. It has, there are these nonspecific symptoms. A third have dyspnea. 5% uh, will develop ARDS, which is the cause of death. Um, and 20% may need um, uh, hospitalization, especially if they have comorbid conditions. Viral shedding peaks a, a few days after symptom onset. So it's the highest when you be, first become symptomatic, but will continue to shed for a median of 12 days. Okay, we skip through this stuff. There's some more transmission dynamics. Uh, one and a half percent of close contacts in China developed, uh, developed disease. So that's disease, disease, not, not infection. Transmission is driven largely by family clusters. The secondary at household attack rate is about 10%. As isolation got better, it fell to 3%. Um, transmission in closed settings has not been a major driver. Schools have been out the whole time, so that hasn't been an amplifier. You can see all that. There's a new wonder drug from Gilead called remdesivir which is in trials now. This is something that was de developed for Ebola that didn't work. It's got some um, anecdotal success in treating MERS patients. Um, and so that's under, under consideration. The other is because there's this protease in, in, in Corona. Think of it as like a long shoelace when it's transcribed. And so it needs to be cut up into pieces to form the virus. The scissors is the protease. Um, and if you look at this little heart-shaped molecule over here, this is the uh, protease, uh, the coronavirus protease. And this blue uh, part is the docking uh, part for the uh, RNA chain that gets cut up to make new viruses. So there's some consideration. There's, in China, they've been using HIV drugs that are, are targeted to HIV protease inhibitors, I'm sorry, proteases, um, with some reported success. Actual trials are underway. In the US, there was a small series of five patients, uh, four or five patients who started protease inhibitors, couldn't tolerate them and had to be stopped. There's also vaccine candidates. They're all over the place. Um, the first one got shipped to NIAID this early this week. Um, it went from sequence publication to vaccine in 42 days. So that's the new normal. Um, and there's a, currently there are 84 trials registered at clinicaltrials.gov. So the strategic goals in terms of public health response are to re reduce the effective reproductive number uh, and to flatten and prolong the outbreak. First of all, to assure that there are enough healthcare facilities going, or enough ICU beds to go around and to buy time for antivirals and eventually uh, vaccine. Here are the elements of the effective reproductive number and how they, uh, um, and how uh, various interventions impact them. So for the number of contacts per day, that's self-distancing, self-quarantine, working from home, uh, hence, hence, uh, hence our uh, seminar on, online today. The probability of, an, of uh, infection per contact, this is about in, in, in medical settings, personal protective equipment outside with about personal hygiene. Infectious, uh, the infectious period, which can be cut by contact tracing to get people out of circulation and into isolation much more quickly. And then population susceptibility, that really has to await um, uh, vaccination. This is the famous flattening of the curve. So in, say in Italy, you've had this very rapid spread 
that's gone, uh, that's saturated the capacity of the, at least the intensive care uh, system to take care of people with severe pneumonia. What we're trying to do with mitigation, and I'll talk about containment versus mitigation in a second, is to spread this out. It's the same area under the curve, but to spread it out over a longer period of time so that the unmet needs for uh, healthcare are less, uh, less extreme. Uh, here's something that Roy Anderson has put into uh, Lancet uh, with uh, kind of three scenarios uh, with this sort of early peak, um, one with social distancing, which is what we're trying to do now, and one which we will find out if it happens here in a couple of days, because this is what's being done in Wuhan. They've had this very early success, the blue line of, of, of limiting the epidemic. Now they're taking their foot off the gas or off the brakes. And the question is whether there's going to be a secondary peak. How do you protect yourselves? You've heard all this stuff. I won't get in, into it. Um, pay attention to how to wash your hands. Soap and water is much more, is more effective than alcohol-based um, uh, hand sanitizers. Uh, this is an important thing. Where do you sit on an airplane? This is really more for the, I, for the IGHS group. You want to sit on a window seat in the middle of the plane, and I will tell you why if there's a question about this, but that's the bottom line. How do we prevent this at the population level? So containment is, refers to individual strategies like isolation and quarantine, um, basic activities, and individual measures you can undertake to increase social distance. I was standing in line for coffee today, and everybody was an arm's length apart. It was very interesting. Um, mitigation is really community-wide measures to essentially force social distance, telecommuting, banning large gatherings, business school and transit closures. We're not at, yet at transit closures, we're on the cusp of school closures. Widespread community quarantine, uh, which is what's been going on in Italy and in China. And then you can also close borders, which is one of these kind of ramp up things. And um, uh, there's been some, uh, some interest in that in the administration. Uh, so we're no more, no more bro hugs. I like the Y in Thailand. Um, this is a picture Sandy Schwartz took on, on Sukhumvit in Bangkok one afternoon. Um, and I thought it was a great picture. So uh, Wang and colleagues have modeled the epidemiology of the first 26,000 lab confirmed cases. In Wuhan, they, they looked at four periods before January, uh, before January 11th, uh, 11 to 22 January, 23 January to 1st February, and 2 to 18 February. And this is what they found um, using their models. Two major findings. One was that their effective reproductive rate had moved from around three very early on, and in the sort of early intermediate stages, to 1.26, and then in the related stage, of 0 0.32, which is why you've seen the curve fall so fast. The other thing is that 59% of cases were unreported. So if you're dealing, so what that means is you have to take whatever the reported number is and divide by 0 0.41. There's an estimate from um, an Australian uh, group of investigators that on, in the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship, uh, that uh, they may have missed uh, an additional 30% of cases that had occurred before the recognizable outbreak had, had happened. So that would mean that you'd have, uh, instead of 49% so under ascertainment, you'd have 30% under ascertainment. So what's been the cost to China for locking everything down? You have 1.4 billion who, people who underwent 10 days of at-home isolation, the virtual shutdown of the national industrial output, um, in Hubei, it's been much more extreme. They've had to open three new hospitals and, a, and 16 modular hospitals to take care of the, of the flow and to deploy an additional 40,000 healthcare uh, workers. Um, so the, uh, I think we can skip this. We'll, we'll get to this, all this stuff thing. So um, we've had a, a, a variety of travel restrictions um, that have gone on. Um, there was one against, uh, against flights from China uh, early on in, in early February um, that's been extended to, that was subsequently extended to Iran and, and South Korea. Um, surprisingly, what happened uh, on, um, on Wednesday night was President Trump uh, announced that they were having 
no more people coming from Europe. Now, what does that mean? So, oh, except the UK was exempted. Uh, but, oh, by the way, Ireland's exempted because it's not part of the Schengen Accord. The Schengen Accord is about free movement through Europe. Um, so it only applies to the 26 Schengen countries. Um, any non-U.S. Citizens, citizens have been in one of those in the last two weeks cannot enter the United States. The U.K. is exempted. Ireland turns out it's exempted. And U.S. residents, permanent residents, and their families are all exempted. There's no place that when, when you look at the number of imported cases or cases related to travel abroad, um, there's no place in the CDC website that says what proportion are non-U.S. citizens and what proportion are U.S. citizens. We have no, I, I, we're a little mystified as to where this comes from. Um, there are a bunch of things of messing around with health insurance and, and tax returns. Um, there have been some fairly spectacular uh, personal stories that people have gotten infected, including actors and the wife of the Prime Minister of Canada. All the major sporting events um, have, been, uh, have been shut down or canceled or, canceled or delayed. So going back to the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, this is a fascinating paper that I think is worthwhile reviewing. It compared 43 different cities in North America and said, what did they do and what was their experience here on the y-axis is excess mortality. So St. Louis uh, the, on the left-hand panel is always held out to be the best example. Uh, they had uh, some excess mortality they had very early um, school closures and banning of, of, of public gatherings. Um, it was, they let their foot off the brakes here in late November and there was a rebound. And that's what I was, that's what Roy Anderson was talking about with the rebound on that uh, red, green and blue graph. Whereas in Pittsburgh, they screwed around, they did it all late and they had huge excess mortality. So the exam, so the lessons are begin social distancing interventions early and keep them going throughout the outbreak period. This is the little handbill you get, if you get on a, off of an airplane to um, monitor your health. Christian Linden gave me this from uh, Monrovia in, uh, in Liberia. You know, if you know somebody from China, you're supposed to call that number. So I don't know how helpful that is. Um, now, so there's been a big colossal financial uh, collapse that's gone along with this that I could talk about are people if interested. There are a lot of other fairly spectacular uh, things WHO re recommended against the handling of paper money, um, just to give you an idea. Uh, in Wuhan, there's, a, there's this fabulous drone footage of what a city that's locked down looks like. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie. But on Tuesday, I'm sorry, on, uh, yeah, Tuesday, Xi Jinping, the Chinese premier, came to Wuhan which was remarkable in and of itself. I uh, visited a hospital, one of the government hospitals, and the and a quarantine neighborhood. Uh, they're letting the they're letting their foot off the brake now. So uh, there's a gradually reopening of stores. The strict quarantine is gradually abating, and what we're going to be looking for is a second wave of transmission. Now, why are we being so aggressive? Why don't we just let this happen? Well, we have a lot of planning that's gone on or SARS and the H1N1 influenza. And also, I, I didn't write it down, is for the H5N1 influenza, which has a much higher fatality rate and is very difficult to raise vaccines against. We also have all this, uh, this uh, Buck Rogers molecular biology, which gives us tons more information, much, much faster uh, than with uh, SARS. And um, this has really gone, we've really gone down the path of a worst case scenario um, uh, a series of, of, of interventions. Um, and we'll see what it is. So the current San Francisco guidelines just modified this morning. Um, for vulnerable populations of people over 60 or certain conditions, don't attend um, gatherings with more than 50 people. Uh, for school, schedule or cancel medium to large non-essential events, I have, um, I, th I believe the San Francisco Unified School District is going to close on Monday. The parochial schools closed yesterday. Uh, for for tr transit, it's just more cleaning. Um, healthcare settings, 
Um, avoid going in unless absolutely necessary and call ahead if you need to. There are all, all the uh, visitors at nursing homes have been now uh, prohibited. Um, so there's a, a for businesses and, and workplaces, suspend non-essential travel, cancel large and play, play uh, large in-person meetings, stay home and if sick and consider telecommuting. And all these all these big gatherings were canceled. It's now down to 250. Um, this was really directed specifically at the Warriors. Um, and now it's down to 250. So reiterating general advice, prepare to work from home. Duh, now we're doing it. Um, make sure you have all this supply of all essential meds. Prepare a child care plan if you're, you or a caregiver is sick. Make a, a arrangements about how your family will manage a school closure and make those quickly. Uh, I would point out there are going to be a lot of teenagers floating around who've been closed out of school too, who need work. So uh, I would say that's a great source of employment for potential babysitters. You don't want all these kids recongregating in some daycare center. That doesn't solve anything. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And what we're really looking at now is where are we going to go? What's the attack rate going to be? Angela Merkel was, was quoted, um, in, uh, earlier this week, said she expected 70% of the German population to be infected. Nancy Messonnier from CDC in Congress said 40 to 70%. The experience with Wuhan is it's around 1%. So I'm not quite sure what everybody's talking about. And even on the Diamond Princess, it was 20%. Um, so, you know, whatever it is, it's gonna be a huge burden on the healthcare system. And Northern Italy is feeling that crunch uh, right now. And the question is, is this gonna come and go? Or will this become a viral, uh, an endemic cause of viral pneumonia for the year, for years to come? And uh, one of the things that's happened, this is a Chinese ophthalmologist in Wuhan who really blew the whistle on this through some social media postings, picked up by the secret police later that night and told not to do it anymore, died about, uh, died about two weeks later, and has become a real focus for anti-government um, uh, uh, activity on the, in, in social media. Uh, I suspect we'll see uh, lots of uh, some changes in China. Thanks. Sorry, uh, sorry, Kirsten. I didn't mean to monopolize all the time. No problem. No problem. Thank you, George. That was really terrific.